Good for Nothing by Mark Fisher Text from TheOccupiedTimes.org I've suffered from depression intermittently since I was a teenager. Some of these episodes have been highly debilitating, resulting in self-harm, withdrawal, where I would spend months on end in my own room, only venturing out to sign on or to buy the minimal amount of food I was consuming, and time spent on psychiatric wards. I wouldn't say I've recovered from the condition, but I'm pleased to say that both the incidences and severity of depressive episodes have greatly lessened in recent years. Partly, that is a consequence of changes in my life situation, but it's also to do with coming to a different understanding of my depression and what caused it. I offer up my own experiences of mental distress, not because I think there's anything special or unique about them, but in support of the claim that many forms of depression are best understood and best combated through frames that are impersonal and political, rather than individual or psychological. Writing about one's own depression is difficult. Depression is partly constituted by a sneering inner voice, which accuses you of self-indulgence. You aren't depressed, you're just feeling sorry for yourself. Pull yourself together, and this voice is liable to be triggered by going public about the condition. Of course, this voice isn't an inner voice at all. It is the internalized expression of actual social forces, some of which have vested interest in denying any connection between depression and politics. My depression was always tied up with the conviction that I was literally good for nothing. I spent most of my life up to the age of 30 believing that I would never work. In my 20s, I drifted about postgraduate study, periods of unemployment and temporary jobs. In each of these roles, I felt that I didn't really belong. In postgraduate study, because I was a dilettante who had somehow faked his way through, not a proper scholar, in unemployment, because I wasn't really unemployed, like those who were honestly seeking work, but a shirker, and in temporary jobs, because I felt I was performing incompetently, and in any case, I didn't really belong in these offices or factory jobs, not because I was too good for them, but, very much to the contrary, because I was overeducated and useless, taking the job as someone who needed and deserved it more than I did. Even when I was in a psychiatric ward, I felt I was not really depressed. I was only simulating the condition in order to avoid work, or in the infernally paradoxical logic of depression, I was simulating it in order to conceal the fact that I was not capable of working, and that there was no place at all for me in society. When I eventually got a job as a lecturer in a further education college, I was for a while elated, yet by its very nature this elation showed that I had not shaken off the feelings of worthlessness that would soon lead to further periods of depression. I lacked the calm confidence of one born to the role. At some not very submerged level, I evidently still didn't believe that I was the kind of person who could do a job like teaching. But where did this belief come from? The dominant school of thought in psychiatry locates the origins of such beliefs in malfunctioning brain chemistry, which are to be corrected by pharmaceuticals. Psychoanalysis and forms of therapy influenced by it famously look for the roots of mental distress and family background while cognitive behavioral therapy is less interested in locating the source of negative beliefs than it is in simply replacing them with a set of positive stories. It is not that these models are entirely false. It is they miss, and must miss, the most likely cause of such feelings of inferiority, social power. The form of social power that had most effect on me was class power, although of course gender, race, and other forms of oppression work by producing the same sense of ontological inferiority, which is best expressed in exactly the thought I articulated above, that one is not the kind of person who can fulfill roles which are earmarked for the dominant group. On the urging of one of the readers of my book, Capitalist Realism, I started to investigate the work of David Smale. Smale, a therapist, but one who makes the question of power central to his practice, confirmed the hypotheses about depression that I had stumbled towards. In his crucial book, The Origins of Unhappiness, Smell describes how the marks of class are designed to be indelible. For those who, from birth, are taught to think of themselves as lesser, the acquisition of qualifications or wealth will seldom be sufficient to erase, either in their own minds or in the minds of others, the primordial sense of worthlessness that marks them so early in life. Someone who moves out of the social sphere they are supposed to occupy is always in danger of being overcome by feelings of vertigo, panic, and horror. Quote, isolated, cut off, surrounded by hostile space, 
you're suddenly without connections, without stability, with nothing to hold you upright or in place. A dizzying, sickening unreality takes possession of you. You're threatened by a complete loss of identity, a sense of utter fraudulence. You have no right to be here, now inhabiting this body, dressed in this way. You are nothing, and nothing is quite literally what you feel you are about to become." End quote. For some time now, one of the most successful tactics of the ruling class has been responsabilization. Each individual member of a subordinate class is encouraged into feeling that their poverty, lack of opportunities, or unemployment is their fault and their fault alone. Individuals will blame themselves rather than social structures, which in any case they have been induced into believing do not really exist. They are just excuses called upon by the weak. What Smell calls magical voluntarism the belief that it is within every individual's power to make themselves whatever they want to be is a dominant ideology and unofficial religion of contemporary capitalist society. Pushed by reality TV experts and business gurus as much as by politicians, magical voluntarism is both an effect and a cause of the currently historically low level of class consciousness. It is a flip side of depression, whose underlying conviction is that we are all uniquely responsible for our own misery and therefore deserve it. A particularly vicious double bind is imposed on the long-term unemployed in the UK now, a population that has, all of its life, been sent the message that it is good for nothing. It is also simultaneously told that it can do anything it wants to. We must understand the fatalistic submission of the UK's population to austerity as a consequence of a deliberately cultivated depression. This depression is manifested in the acceptance that things will get worse, for all but a small elite, that we are lucky to have a job at all, so we shouldn't expect wages to keep pace with inflation, that we cannot afford the collective provision of the welfare state. Collective depression is the result of the ruling class project of resubordination. For some time now, we have increasingly accepted the idea that we are not the kind of people who can act. This isn't a failure of will any more than an individual depressed person can snap themselves out of it by pulling up their socks. The rebuilding of class consciousness is a formidable task indeed, one that cannot be achieved by calling upon ready-made solutions. But, in spite of what our collective depression tells us, it can be done. Inventing new forms of political involvement, reviving institutions that have become decadent, converting privatized dissatisfaction into politicized anger, all of this can happen, and when it does, who knows what is possible.